Uh, I'm going to be talking about why working with third parties shouldn't suck. Uh, but before I get into it, I want to say a special thanks to our lunch sponsors. So I hope everybody's still awake after lunch. Uh, I also want to say special thanks to Kurt, Ingrid, and William from Home Depot uh, for encouraging me to do this. And if you guys don't like the talk, you can go ahead and blame them as well. Um, so to get into this, uh, I want to talk a little bit about... So what I want to talk about first is uh, these are my opinions based on my experiences and lessons learned. Uh, I want to at least acknowledge a bias that I might have. I started my own company and now I am a vendor, so you know, I might lean towards you know, buying instead of building or adopting a technology. Uh, I'm going to try not to for the purposes of this talk. Uh, if I happen to name drop companies, I'm not endorsing products or the companies or anything like that. Uh, just slip of the tongue. Um, and my expertise is all based on CDN, DNS, certificate authorities, APM solutions. Uh, at, uh, at LinkedIn, I managed, uh, I didn't manage, but I was the lead for a team that did all the DNS, CDN, uh, certificate authority management um, for all of LinkedIn and LinkedIn's SREs. We were responsible for building tooling and automation and implementing solutions that ensured LinkedIn remained up. Uh, I did some similar things at Netflix and Comcast, but in a slightly different world. And I branched off and I started my own company to focus on, uh, on how to manage traffic infrastructure better. So all the things like CDN, DNS, and how they all tie in. Um, and, and the whole reason for that is something that's for another day. Um, what I want to do is maybe talk about something sort of controversial um, or not. Uh, but trying to define site reliability engineering is something that I thought was critical for the context of this talk. Uh, site reliability engineering, to me, uh, means a lot of different things, and I just want to share these opinions with you guys. Uh, but before I do that, I want to share some of my favorite quotes that I've seen. So Ben Trainer, what happens when a, uh, this SRE is what happens when a software engineer is tasked with what used to be called operations. But my favorite quote is actually, SRE is DevOps for companies that have money. Uh, I, I laugh at that, um, but what's, what's really interesting about that is the distinction as SRE has branched out of, uh, of Silicon Valley and moved into Austin. This happens to be where I heard this quote. Um, but really, what is site reliability engineering? Is it a set of tenets, right? Is it uh, that we're building automation, we're building tooling, we're embedded with, uh, with sister teams, um, you know, are, are we concerned about monitoring and alerting and logging and all that other stuff? I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, but that leads me into the next question about what is a third party, right? What do, we, what do we call a third party? And I look at a lot of these, and again, I'm not endorsing any of these companies. It just happens to be a bunch of logos that I've pulled. Um, but a lot of the third parties that a lot of companies use and rely on are things like DNS providers, NS1, Dyn, Newstar. Uh, CDN providers, Fastly, Akamai, Limelight, Level 3, uh, APM solutions for synthetic monitoring like Catchpoint or Keynote, Gomez, Pingdom, uh, log analysis tools, you know, things like PagerDuty for escalations, VictorOps. Uh, we, we also have things that I didn't include up here, which are things like messaging, you know, but the Twilio's of the world, the MailChimp's, the Spark Post. These are all third parties that we utilize in some way in our companies that I feel a lot of folks sort of throw their hands up and they say, you know, I'm paying another company. I don't really have to do much about any of this, right? Yeah, I'm paying somebody else to manage all of these different things that are running. This, is, this isn't something that I really need to control. And it's also something that maybe I feel like I don't have control over. Um, leads me to the next question, which is, can you be an SRE and run some of these third-party solutions? And I think the answer here isn't just yes or no. This is a, you fucking have to, right? If you are relying on things like DNS and CDN for, uh, to run your site, why aren't you monitoring it? Why are you letting it sort of run blindly, especially with something like DNS? Why don't you have something in place that allows you to, uh, to, to stay up if one of your DNS providers goes down, if you only have a single DNS provider for that matter? Are there things that you can do as a site reliability engineer that will allow your site to remain online? And so I'm gonna walk through everything that I've learned uh, in my 
journey and uh, give you some advice and tips on things that I've learned. Um, but my deal here is really based on you know, what happened a little over, uh, a little short of a year and a half ago. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, one of the largest DNS providers uh, went out of service, and a lot of people were affected by this. And even if you weren't affected by uh, the outage directly, you may have been affected indirectly because one of your, th your service providers was affected by this. So this happened to be the case with a lot of payments processors that were reliant on a single DNS provider. And so there was this chain reaction that took place that, uh, that, that a lot of people were affected by, and it took down about half of the internet. Uh, and as a result, there were a lot of studies that were conducted that, uh, that, that focused on how many companies rely on third-party technologies. Uh, and of them, how many were affected within the last six months, and how many expect to be affected again anytime soon. And we see that the numbers here are actually pretty high, 89% and 92% respectively. And so for this matter, I, I think that third parties shouldn't just be treated as these little ancillary things that, that sort of help make your site run, but they're really an extension of your overarching technology stack. And so that leads me to, to a question that, that's been a lot of debate in, in, <laughs> in a lot of different ways uh, throughout my career, which is, are we going to build something or are we going to buy something? And I branch that out and, uh, and find a happy medium with an adopt solution as well. Because uh, what, what I've seen is when people say that they're just going to build something in-house, what they're really saying is they're just going to introduce some open source technology and make that work uh, for their organization. But really, that's more of an adopt solution. And some of the things that I talk about when I discuss uh, the buy uh, components will apply to adopt as well. Um, now, there, there are reasons you might go and build your own thing. It might be because there is nothing out there that you can pay for or even adopt into your organization that will give you what you need. Um, and it's up to you to figure out whether or not it's something you have to do or not. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about that as much. Um, but buy and adopt, right? The, the clear distinctions here are there's, in the buy category, it's a SaaS or licensed solution that will you know, uh, tend to some common problem. Uh, whereas adopt is building around an open source tool or set of tools. So these are, you know, uh, again, I'm not going <laughs> to name drop, but I, I think you guys can sort of figure out some of these solutions. Um, but as we talk about, you know, build versus buy versus adopt, we really need to be asking ourselves a lot of different questions along the way, which are things like, what problems being solved here? You know, how does this impact the bottom line? You know, I can go through and list all of these and argue about all of these, but I'm not. I'm only going to focus on a few. And that is, what is the problem that's being solved? Is this a core competency of mine? And do, do, you know, do I have the capacity, or does my company have the capacity to solve for it? Um, what considerations are being made to CapEx, OpEx, uh, and two new things that I call PropEx and ABEX? Uh, PropEx is the overall project operating expense. This has historically been um, a, a line item in the CapEx table, but this ultimately affects the, long, the longevity of the project. And then there's a ABEX, which is abandonment. Right? These are things that you have to consider when you either adopt or buy. When you buy a solution, how hard is it going to be to pull out of that solution should you know, they, they mess up royally? Uh, or should, you, should they not scale at the same rate that you're scaling at? Um, you know, what impact does that have to my integration timeline? Uh, how easy is it to, to shunt these things in place? And what are the risks and benefits to doing any of this stuff? And so as I look at the full set of those things, you know, I'm, I categorize what I, what I really need to be doing when I'm, when I'm looking at the buy solutions versus the adopt solutions. So in, in the buy category, it's usually you know, me needing to solve something immediately. Um, you know, I have some, I'm, have some really short-term commits uh, that, that, I, uh, that I have to answer to. Um, I know that it's, it's not my core competency, but it might be someone else's. So it, it might make sense to buy their solution. And in a lot of cases, you're also buying into support. Whereas in the adopt category, some of the benefits there are that you will get a support network. Um, you'll get a lot of functionality out of the box. 
uh, and, and you'll have access to source code. But for all of the benefits that you get from either of these, there are also risks that, that go into it. So things like cost and the inability to control things. And I think there are a lot of things that you can sort of engineer around uh, you know, with enough diligence. Um, part of that diligence is knowing what to ask for and how to ask for it. Uh, there's generally a, uh, uh, a process um, when you start working with third parties. And part of that is the, the RFI or RFP, Request for Information, Request for Proposal. Um, the, the things that you need to, to ask for need to be very concise and easy for that third party to, uh, to answer. You know, what are the things that you need? Um, what are the things that you need to be solving for? Uh, where are we going to be going with this over the long term? Um, how, uh, how thorough is this solution going to be for, for what we're trying to do? Um, and some things to look for, and these are, these are more uh, subtle, if you will, uh, are whether or not that vendor gets back to you in a timely manner, um, whether or not they're thorough with the responses. You know, are they going to send you a canned response? Or are they going to send you like everything that addresses every single line item in your RFP? Uh, it indic in indicates how uh, how good they're going to be for the longevity of any contract that you go into with them, and then how direct are they? Um, you know, and how direct are you with them? A lot of this is indicative indicative of their ability to meet any of the commits. So, if they can directly answer a question that you pose, then uh, it's very likely that you're you're going to be dealing with somebody who's dealt with a lot of the problems that that you're asking them about. Whereas if they dance around uh, a question that you've asked, chances are you're not going to get what you're what you're looking for. Um, I'm going to skip over this uh, a little bit, um, but uh, part of the diligence in buying any sort of technology is that you really need to try it out. Um, and you need to determine whether or not what you do with these third parties is going to be using production data or simulated data, uh, whether or not you, you need to set up the entire environment or just a subset of that, and whether or not the integration is complicated or straight, you know, and straightforward. Uh, or, or straightforward. And, and the reason any of this matters is because setup and evaluation will indicate how crappy this solution is going to be for you long term. Um, so things to look for uh, when doing any sort of trials with any third parties are, you know, what sort of support do you get and what level of handholding do you need? Uh, if you need a lot of handholding, chances are you're not going to want to work with them because you won't be able to do anything on your own. How complex is it? Like, uh, you know, it, it, is this something that I'm absolutely going to need help with? for the long term? Am I going to have to send an email to a sales engineer every single time I need to make a change, or can I do a lot of this stuff on my own? And then what kind of communication do you get back? And what you'll see as I continue through a lot of these slides is communication is, is a big thing uh, that, um, that, that we need to have with our third parties. Um, because these third parties, <laughs> if they don't have to answer to you, they won't. <laughs> right? They're not going to reach out unless you actually reach out to them first. And so for that reason, you'll, you'll notice a common theme here, which is communication. Um, but <clears throat> uh, during the trial, this matters especially because this is indicative of how much you really mean to them. How much is your business worth it to them? Is it worth it enough for them to reach out and say, hey, we noticed you're not touching our portal. Hey, we noticed uh, you, you put a configuration in that doesn't make sense. Can we help you? Uh, and a lot of that will help you um, for, for the long term. Um, as you evaluate some of this stuff, uh, you want to keep score. Um, when I was at LinkedIn, we had a really nice scorecard that we used for evaluating our providers. Uh, you know, but, but a lot of these things um, will have to reflect any of the requirements that you've handed off during the RFP and RFI process. Uh, and you'll have to apply weights to these scores. And some of them are objective. Uh, meaning they can be tested fairly easily, and some of them are going to be subjective, right? Is the provider comprehensive uh, with their sets of dashboards and templates, right? I mean, is there a real answer to that? You know, if if uh, you know if this is just what I need, then that's 
perfect, and you can move on. But that's subject to, you know, what whatever you feel. And then you have to realize that you're not going to be able to test everything. Like so many different providers have so many different bells and whistles that, uh, <laughs> in the long run, don't really mean anything to a lot of users. And so it, you're you're not going to be able to test a lot of those uh, sorts of things. Um, so a as you go through the process of keeping score, you'll also want to note that you might have have to hand off these scorecards to third parties. So if you say anything like negative, like you know, a as part of your scoring, like oh, this this was a piece of crap UI, uh, be prepared to have to answer for that. Um, so once we've picked a vendor, what happens when we put that vendor out in the wild and we start using that vendor? Right? So, so this is what I call putting the vendor in the critical path, or even when we don't put them in the critical path and they just sort of sit uh, outside of the critical path. And I'm, I'm going to take a second here to sort of define how I think of critical path, and that's whether or not they're in the path of what my users are going to experience directly versus indirectly. And so if you think about it, things like DNS and CDN are very much in the direct critical path. The indirect critical paths are more along the lines of your messaging platforms. Um, but part of these third-party integrations and where, where this is super important to folks like SREs is this is a never-ending story, right? We, we don't just set it and forget it and walk away. You know, this is a tool that we're going to use for the long term. Um, so as such, we're going to want to put things in place that ensure that us as SREs are able to operate with these third parties as if they were a service within our own technology stack. So these things that, that I am going to focus on are things like measuring performance of that integration. So how do you do that with a DNS provider? How do you do that with CDN? Uh, monitoring and alerting. What are you actually looking for with your CDN providers? And what sort of tools do you have access to? Um, and same thing goes for any of these other third-party applications, whether it's you know, Jira or messaging. Um, what sort of logging and alerting access do you have? Uh, do, what sort of logging and alerting do you have access to? So these things are really important if you could care about observability. And if you notice, measuring performance, monitoring, alerting, logging, auditing, a lot of this really talks, tells us, you know, what what the hell's going on with with this thing that we have, uh, and that will lead us to being able to solve for whatever is broken. And you can't do that with any one of these alone. Um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't have logging, especially when it's like a third party, you know, if you're treating them as a black box, how do you know how to triage and diagnose any sort of issue? Um, and so up, I'll walk through some lessons learned here. Uh, the other part of this is what sort of tooling and automation can we put around any of these third party pieces of technology? So with, with a CDN or a DNS provider, again, this is my this is where I come from. But what what kind of tooling did we actually need to have for DNS? Was this uh, you know is it important that um, you know we have a self service utility or are we going to have to you know provide credentials to all 16,000 engineers at LinkedIn? You know that that's just not going to scale. You know, we have to think about writing a playbook and have a disaster plan. So we'll go into these a little bit more in depth. Uh, so for for measuring performance, one of the things that I like uh, is synthetic monitoring. I love it um, because it gives you a good sort of baseline for uh, testing what your third parties are doing. Um, there, there are certain ways to do it um, with things like CDN, with things like DNS, uh, with certificate authorities. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> uh, but there, there are things that you should be doing to exercise a lot of these, a lot of these things. If you have an API that you rely on, why aren't you testing it? Chances are, your third parties also have their own SRE or ops teams that uh, that are running a lot of this stuff. Um, you need to sort of, I don't want to say that you you need to be an SRE to their SRE team, but you do need to be an SRE to your customers. The, the people that, that you have to answer to. And for that reason, something like synthetic monitoring will bubble up any sort of information. But synthetic monitoring doesn't work really well on its own. Um, what, it, <laughs> what it does do is it provides you a lot of false, uh, false negatives um, if you're not careful. 
Um, so what I like to do is complement synthetic with real user. So what what can you actually implement, uh, especially if you're running a large website, that will allow you to view what your users are experiencing, um, and how creative can you be with with those sorts of things. Um, with monitoring and alerting, how do you monitor and alert on a third-party application? So, for instance, with CDN uh, or DNS, how do I know how many uh, HTTP error codes are being emitted? How do I know how many NX domains are being emitted by my DNS providers? Um, I argue that you can't really rely fully on the reporting APIs because they're generally not going to provide you with uh, any sort of real-time data. You really can't fix what you can't see. Um, so again, I, I lean on real user stuff as well as the synthetic. Uh, and then when we start looking at things like logging and auditing, this really completes this observability, uh, the, the, the suite of observability, which is, you know, you, you have to be able to consume as much as you can in real time. So things like, uh, you know, logs, whether or not they're uh, real time from your providers is, is one thing. Um, but they supplement a lot of the reporting APIs that you're going to be able to get. Uh, and they give you a lot more detail than what you'd be able to get via APIs alone. Um, with this in mind, you, you'll want to consider GDPR. Um, so if, does everybody know what GDPR is? Uh, you're probably all scrambling to figure out how the hell it affects you and, and what you're going to do. Um, general data protection regulations for Europe, it just enhances a lot of the privacy stuff. Uh, make sure you're on top of it. When you're doing things like logging, logging and auditing, uh, you'll want to prune a lot of the data that comes in because things like IP addresses are considered PII. And you'll want to prune a lot of that or do whatever is necessary according to, uh, to the general data uh, protection regulations to ensure that your end users are masked. And also realize you, you're not going to be able to consume it all. Um, for a lot of the logging and auditing stuff, you might be able to implement yet another third party, like uh, you know, like a log processing company. Um, but even then, it's going to be super expensive, and you're not going to be able to to take everything in. So you're you're going to want to prune as much as you can uh, for tooling and automation. So how do your customers interact with your services, and how much self-service can you provide to them? Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a uh, of a detailed story here. So with you know, uh, uh, let's see. How many folks have been to Velocity? Or a couple? All right. Uh, anyways, one of my former coworkers uh, at LinkedIn gave a talk uh, last year about how LinkedIn manages multiple providers. Um, and what we what we did at LinkedIn was uh, implement multiple DNS providers, so two managed DNS platforms as well as a synthetic. Uh, I'm sorry, a real a RUM DNS solution. And then we had up to six CDNs running simultaneously around the world. And the only way we were able to do that was by putting in the, the tooling and automation that were necessary to allow uh, for the other SREs and engineers within the organization to configure their own, uh, to configure their own DNS entries and um, make some, some pretty generic requests for what they needed out of CDN and allow us to run through it uh, with, with, um, with very little heavy lifting. Um, so what we want to try to do here is avoid becoming a choke point, and then we also want to implement certain abstraction layers so that we can uh, add or remove providers as necessary. Um, as part of this, we also want to plan for failure. So you know, what, what is your disaster plan if one of your third parties dies, right? If, uh, if there's another DNS outage, uh, if there's a CDN outage in some part of the world, what is your mitigation strategy? What are you going to do? Are you going to let that happen? Or do you have a solution that allows for, uh, for any sort of real user measurements to steer to a completely different CDN? Do you have a strategy in place to, uh, to, to handle all of the DNS queries at the authoritative level to, uh, you know, in case another DNS provider goes down. Um, there, there are things that you need to plan for. 
uh, especially with third parties, because you're not going to have the same sort of visibility that you'd, you'd have over them that you might have over your own services. So you want to be careful with uh, you, you know, how you implement these plans. Um, you want to hold your third parties accountable for their SLAs. And you know, who, who here thinks SLAs are bullshit anyways? Right? Like CDNs and DNS providers say a certain thing about their SLAs. Um, I think they're a little inflated. But uh, again, that's my opinion. Um, but when they do have an outage, you want to make sure they're held accountable for it. Uh, make sure you're requesting uh, credits <laughs> when there is a service outage, because if, it, if, if, if you saw it, chances are your end users saw it as well, uh, and they were impacted by it, which has damage not only to your revenue, potentially, but also your, your brand's reputation. Uh, you'll also want to make sure that with accountability in mind, you're asking for a detailed RCA. Right? You want to know exactly what happened. Um, and in the same way, you might run your own, uh, uh, sorry, brain fart. Um, the, the same way you might run your own postmortem, you, you might want to request the exact same thing out of them, but in a public facing way. So you, you want to know from them how long it took them to detect the problem. In a lot of cases at, at LinkedIn, we were escalating issues before uh, our third party Knox even had a chance to, to see it because we had such granular control over what we were monitoring uh, and, and how we were steering around problems. Um, you you want to uh, make sure you establish good KPIs and share those with, uh, with your third parties and maintain some sort of cadence uh, in communicating with your third parties as well. Um, at, at LinkedIn, we had uh, something called a Service Integration Manager, who was sort of like a PM, but dealing mainly with uh, our third parties. And she kept them um, she kept them very well aligned with what LinkedIn was working on, uh, not just as a company, but what our SRE team was looking to accomplish over the long term uh, that went well beyond the contract that we had with each third party, so that they could plan accordingly uh, and, and make sure that they maintain some sort of alignment with where we were going. A good example of this are you know, communicating that we had video in the pipeline at least a year before video actually hit your LinkedIn feeds. Um, and, and that's just something that we needed to make sure we got out of the way as we started looking at uh, deploying video around the world. So this sort of brings us to the end, and I'm, I have to apologize if you're asleep at this point. Uh, nobody likes to talk about third parties. I do. I get excited about it. Um, but some of the things to take away here are, you know, you really want to treat third parties as if they're an extension of your stack. They're not ancillary. Um, one of the, you know, one of the things that I like to say about uh, third parties is that they're not just a solution to to a problem that you can walk away from. They're more like a tool that sits within your tool set as an SRE. Um, and they should be treated like that. Uh, you, you know, if, if I hired a carpenter, and I, I talked to Pablo about this at lunch, but if I hire a carpenter to come install some cabinets in my house, um, you know, if he shows up with just a hammer and a box of cabinets, and he's like, all right, where do you want them? And he goes and puts them up, and then they're crooked. Uh, you know, they're in the wrong spot. Um, you know, and all he used was a hammer, and they're going to fall down on me later, I'm going to be kind of pissed. Uh, but as an SRE, right, we have a lot of different tools that we use. And with a third party being sort of like a hammer, we want to make sure we have other things in our tool belts, like levels and screwdrivers and drill bits and stud binders. And we want to communicate with the customers as well. We want to make sure that where they want these cabinets, well, are you sure? Because it might cover an outlet. Right? It might block some of the light. A lot of these things are things we need to work out as SREs when we're dealing with uh, not only our internal customers, so the, you know, the, the people that are responsible for business, our end users, and our, our third parties. When we choose a vendor, it's going to be a time-intensive process. And so you'll want to, you know, if, if you didn't sort of grab that from my walkthrough, there's a lot of stuff to consider. And there's a lot of planning that you have to do. So it's it's going to take a long time. Uh, usually a quarter is, is what I like to say, uh, if, if it's something that sits in the critical path. If you're looking at a $15 contract for, for like, you know, Pingdom, sorry. Uh, who cares, right? Uh, it's 15 bucks. But if you're looking at a multi-million dollar contract over the course of a year, 
then it's a big deal. And you'll want to spend time actually analyzing whether or not it's, it's going to be the solution that you need. Um, if it's in the critical path, you've got to treat it like a service. You know, you got to run it with the same level of monitoring, alerting, logging, automation, tooling, the same sorts of things that you might build into your own applications. Uh, you, you'll want to make sure that, that you're doing that for the third parties. And if you maintain good communication with your third parties, you're actually going to have a lot of, a lot of fun working with them. Um, you, you start getting insights into what they, have, uh, what they have going on internally and what their limitations are. And with that, any questions? And if you do have questions, come up to the mic. I'll start you off with a question. So you've got a process for choosing a vendor. Do you also have a process for choosing to end a relationship with a vendor? <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the things I didn't touch on as much during this talk was how to end uh, how to end that relationship with the third party. So there, there's sort of two things that I talk about when I talk about ending relationships with third parties. Is one, uh, you want to keep that third party well informed of uh, of any sort of issues that you're having. And there are many reasons you're going to end a relationship with the third party. Uh, some of those are they're not uh, they're not honoring their portion of the contract. You know, they they have significant downtime. They have limitations in what they're able to do. Um, they're, they're not resolving the problems that you're escalating. So you might terminate the contract uh, you know, before time's up. And uh, if you don't terminate that contract before time's up, you're going to terminate it at the end of the contract. If, if it is the case that you're going to terminate that contract, communication is something that you have to maintain. Um, you have to have a good record of what was going on. And you also have to make sure that uh, that you've indicated to them on numerous occasions that there are problems going on with their service that are going to be detrimental to the renewal of a contract. Um, and, uh, you know, th there are people at play here. You know, you, it, with a third party, you're not just dealing with another company. You're, all, you're dealing with people. And, you know, some folks don't really care that they're dealing with people, but I, I do. Uh, and so when you terminate a contract, it, it could actually be detrimental to the to the salesperson that was responsible. So maintaining good communication is a big deal. Uh, terminating a contract or ending services uh, should be, well, depending on the size of the contract, should be done with about a quarter of notice, quarter's time of notice, um, especially with large contracts where they're delivering you know, lots of data on your behalf. So CDNs are specifically the ones that I've dealt with. Does that answer your question? Easy.